Day 13 and a half, this plant fell over, it's the tallest one, and that was shortly after I sprayed some isopropanol, so I don't know if that damaged the plant or if it just fell over, you know, from its own weight, because these are intended to be vines. And this plant, uh, the one that has the roots going along the side of the bowl, for whatever reason, overnight, its cotyledons folded up, so I don't know if that's any kind of habit of this plant to prevent predation, um, but it's pretty interesting. It's not day 14 yet, but this plant that fell down, the second seedling, has curved around due to phototropism, and I'm worried that the root might have broken, but I'm not sure that it has. Um, you know, and even so, I think the plant could possibly recover by extending some new roots. So we'll see what happens. And as for this other plant, it opened up its cotyledons, which is pretty interesting. They're open at roughly a 45 degree angle, you know, or a right angle to each other, instead of uh, being fully open. Day 14. So first we're going to talk about the one that fell down. It seems to have uh, intact roots. So on the foliage end, uh, you see a new leaf coming out. I think these leaves are going to be serrated and maybe shovel shaped, uh, spade shaped. So different from the cotyledons. Uh, these cotyledons are huge and they still haven't broken out of the seed yet. Um, which seems to be a recurring theme for all of these seeds that were germinated in uh, water as opposed to the ones that were germinated in soil. So uh, another thing you can see is a slight bump here, and let me point it out, right here, um, that basically seems like it could be another kind of meristem uh, growing a new leaf or stem, and that might be because this plant has been lying down horizontally, so that could be the new dominant shoot apical meristem. If you look at the base, uh, you know, this plant just fell over yesterday after I sprayed with uh, isopropanol. I don't think that's related. I think just the mist and the liquid weight was too much for the root to bear. And it just sort of snapped, but I don't see evidence of dying yet. Uh, I'm pretty sure the root system will reestablish itself and whatever broke will heal quickly. So 10 hours ago these leaves were separated by about 90 degrees and about 18 hours ago these leaves were closed surprisingly when I woke up and left for work. So that's a amazing you know feature that this plant has. Uh, I wouldn't have expected to see it in something like honeydew. So this is one of the latecomers. It seems to be doing fairly well but um, the seed is kind of sodden looking and it has traces of black mold. I haven't seen any filaments yet, but I'll keep an eye out for that. So here are the two other seeds to germinate. I almost overlooked this. This is a ninth seed that has germinated. Overall I would say things are progressing very nicely. Uh, nine plants seem to be on the rise and there are a whole bunch of phenotypes that I hadn't anticipated. With regards to extermination efforts of black mold, uh, I'm not sure if the isopropanol conclusively did anything, but I don't see any signs of new developing black mold on the soil or on the seeds today, so I think that's a very good sign. So I'm not looking at footage of day 13 and comparing it to what I see right now, but I would assume there's more root development just from this one plant that has a you know, flapping cotyledons, so to speak. And the surrounding soil is drier than it was yesterday. And that's because I haven't been watering due to the mold issue. Um, not too deeply, anyway. I just sprayed the surface yesterday, so I think I'll start watering more again just to see if I can germinate more seeds and to provide water, sufficient water for all of the existing plants. Plant 2 is still exhibiting strong phototropism as it curved during the day to come back to the light source. It's the morning after the start of day 14 and again these cotyledons have folded up overnight and that's definitely not due to turgor pressure loss uh, or 
you know, internal water pressure loss from lack of water because I watered these plants before I went to sleep. I think this adaptation is for collecting dew that collects on these plants overnight. So as you can see with the leaves nearly vertical, dew drops would fall down and go down the stem and eventually collect at where the root is. So that's a useful adaptation for getting some extra water for seedlings and for a seedling every drop counts. Day 15. So these unencumbered cotyledons have opened up again during the so-called day, which is when I have my LED light shining on these plants for hours. If dew droplets formed on these leaves in this configuration overnight in the wild, it's likely that they would evaporate. So it makes sense that the leaves would close at night, providing a more vertical angle for water droplets to form on and uh, bind together and roll down the stem to water the plant. With that said, this plant is starting to develop its first mature leaf. So if we get a close-up of this plant that's fell on the ground and is unable to get back up, you can see that at least one leaf, a mature leaf, with jagged edges is starting to develop. I can't tell at this point whether that's two leaves, but it just looks like one leaf folded up. So this seedling is having this seedling is having a lot of trouble escaping from the mud and the seed husk, which is sort of wedged in the mud. And here's another seedling that faces the same problem. Its uh, seed husk is also trapped in the mud. So the stem is doing all sorts of contortions to try to escape that. Here's another example of yet another seedling that's having a really tough time trying to escape its seed. Thus far I've discussed nine seedling subjects and this is a tenth that's germinating right now. It happened sometime in the last few hours. And this seed in the center of the screen is a, a little bit contorted and abnormal looking, but it's also starting to germinate. So that makes 11 out of 47 potential plants. Um, I started with 50, but I threw away three due to mold. Well, here are two ungerminated seeds, and I don't see any kind of mold growing on them. So I think treating the seeds with isopropanol beforehand might actually be a very good strategy I don't think just washing them will be enough because after all they do come out of a fruit which has plenty of sugar uh, fructose in it so when you wash them they're still residual food so to speak all that meat and all the juice inside the honeydew that can easily nourish the growth of mold and bacteria okay so if you look at the most successful plant now it wasn't the first to germinate but simply the first to escape its seed husk and thus have ever-growing giant cotyledons to absorb the most uh, sunlight or photons from this artificial light and start photosynthesizing. So if you follow the stem down there, this is the one that's hugging the side of the glass bowl and it has the most extensive root system. If you look underneath, I have, haven't done this thus far, you know. Um, it has a lot more roots. I believe this stuff coming from the middle is from some other plants uh, in the middle but you know just look at how many roots look at this network of roots that have been produced by I'm pretty sure it's just this one plant uh, there could be some contribution from this plant also but that's pretty amazing it just goes to show that for plants you know the root system is actually the most important and that's the part we don't see so once a good root system is established it anchors the plant from falling over and it basically sucks up a lot of water to provide for growth and you know for a growing seedling like this you know carbon dioxide is definitely not a limiting factor it's virtually unlimited unless it's in a closed environment which never happens naturally for a plant and the next limiting factor would be water so a lot of water that I spray will travel along the edges and sink to the bottom of the bowl so this is a region with moist soil and this would be a dry region this would be a dry region too and thus you know having a root network here collects all that water so that that's not a limiting variable and finally because the seed husk fell off early on for this plant it's very fortunate um, it has the largest cotyledons now and they're just photosynthesizing and providing new uh, carbohydrates, sugars, for the plant to grow. And, you know, plants synthesize everything they need, uh, all their proteins, 
and lipids and so forth. And that's just based on, um, you know, using the carbohydrate energy that they synthesize um, provided, you know, in combination with the minerals and trace elements they need from the soil. So to wrap up, eventually this dominant seedling is going to come into competition with the other seedlings or you can look at it from the other way around. I mean, this seedling that still has the double seed husk attached to it, the very first one to germinate, is now being blocked by the large leaves of this seedling. So, um, you know, they're all under competition with each other. They're going to form a giant root ball in this bowl since it's not very big. It only has five centimeters of soil in it and water basically won't be a factor in my artificial conditions because I'll just keep spraying as soon as I see that the soil is dry but uh, there's going to be competition for sunlight and unless I get more lamps and you know shine them on these plants from every single angle uh, there are going to be some that will lose out and start growing slower and others that win out such as this one and grow even faster it's day 16 and this is a close-up of the plant that fell on the ground and has a curved stem due to phototropism. Uh, the phototropism isn't really applicable anymore since it's uh, lying mostly parallel to the ground so it just doesn't have the structural support it needs at the base from the roots to uh, bend normally like all the other saplings, uh, I mean seedlings are. So it's developing a first true leaf and as you can see it has jagged edges it looks to be a lot different than the cotyledons it has veins that you can clearly see and you know the way this might develop is it might grow perpendicularly to the cotyledons at least that's what I'm hoping for otherwise this and many other seedlings will have trouble if leaves try to develop in the same direction or groove as the cotyledons they'll just form a ball and get nowhere basically and that'll be a lot of wasted uh, resources directed towards leaf development that won't um, enable the plant to do any more photosynthesis than it is now. So this is the tallest plant right now. It just kind of shot up overnight and it also has a first true leaf developing but it has a problem due to the constriction caused by the attached seed husk. So this is a recurring problem with many of these seedlings the cotyledons just remain unevenly developed and underdeveloped and curled around into a O shape basically and bound by the old seed husk. And I don't know why these things just can't break out of their seed husks naturally. I'm not going to lend a helping hand because this is a big experiment to see how all of these seedlings can develop and react on their own. Um, without much outside help, outside of you know mold extermination and pathogen extermination. I'm trying not to interfere. So this one has the largest true leaf and as you can see that green spike uh, at the base of it, near the base of it, is the apical shoot meristem and that's still growing and it should produce another leaf so I'm hoping these grow perpendicularly to the directions in which the cotyledons have developed. So this is another example of a problem that's never been solved. This is the one where half of the seed fell off in the beginning and the other half and uh, some membranous structures and white matter have just stuck to these cotyledons and prevented them from unfolding and maximizing photosynthesis and that stunts the development of this plant. But this one also has a true leaf developing in the middle. So here's an example of a very young seedling that just has a whole mess of a seed husk with attached dirt stuck on its uh, cotyledons and thus you know really it takes light to penetrate the cotyledons and shine on the other side of the leaves to uh, photosynthesize on their on the proper you know side that normally should be facing up so this is really inefficient uh, there's also photosynthesis going on inside the stem too and you know, I think this is still providing sufficient food for the plant, but it really needs to break free of this to grow a lot faster. So here's another example of cotyledons that are having a really hard time escaping a, a seed that's stuck to the ground. But at least in this case, you can see 
the conolidin that's facing up is a uh, verdant dark green because it can photosynthesize you know properly and here's an example of a seedling that's completely contorted in trying to escape its seed husk so this one is almost coiled up like a spring and at some point you know with enough growth it will break free so if you look towards the end that's germinating on the seed you can see a little bit of mold development um, it just kind of looks like dust or filamentous structures so this is a problem you know I sprayed 70 percent isopropanol two or three days ago and that seemed to solve the problem temporarily but you know it always seems to be the seeds that are growing the mold and not the dirt itself so I sterilized the dirt in the beginning of this growth experiment by baking it in the oven for half an hour at 300 Fahrenheit and I don't think you know the same can be said for the seeds I mean basically I just washed them in tap water and you know tap water has a lot of pathogens in it so I think that was the problem in the beginning and if I do this experiment again I definitely will pay a lot more attention to sterilizing the outside of the seed so this doesn't happen but you know it's also possible that air inoculation can introduce mold spores so I'm gonna give everything here another spray with isopropanol and see if that solves the problem if it doesn't I might have to resort to more drastic measures I've heard that Lysol actually can be safely sprayed into potted plants so with isopropanol the problem is uh, it's an alcohol so it evaporates within a few minutes and if it hasn't killed everything by then basically something can start growing back or anything can inoculate after it dries away and vaporizes from the soil so the thing with something like Lysol is it would leave a bunch of antiseptic chemicals behind that would coat the surface and soak into the soil over time when you water it and that would kill a lot of things or prevent microbes from growing okay so now I'm going to spray some isopropanol and see if there are any adverse effects Okay, so it has a very pungent, alcoholish odor, but uh, basically that's a lot more than I sprayed last time. So we'll see if the mold problem goes away by tomorrow and stays that way for at least another few days. If not, I'll have to resort to something more drastic like the Lysol. I don't like the idea of, idea of changing the soil chemistry and having something that's scented you know permanently in the soil but I might have to do it and it still sounds a lot more attractive than spraying pesticides everywhere okay so with regards to root development this uh, one plant with a fully functioning cotyledons free of the seed husk has you know generated a lot more roots in its system and as you can see I think some other plants have started to hit the bottom as well but it's mostly that plant I believe so that just goes to show um, you know how extensive the root development can be for just one little seedling and how it has that first mover advantage so I expect that plant to do the best out of all of them